Ducks fans, are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. Welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Richard, and we are back. It's been about a month or so. We've both been super busy, but we've got plenty of things to cover the Ducks' end of the season where they finished up uh, getting the number one draft lottery spot. Uh, we'll also talk about Dallas Aikens uh, not coming back, some other candidates they're going to look at, and uh, some potential trades and whatnot that the Ducks may do, and tons of fan questions, tons and tons of stuff to get to. So should be a good show. Glad to be back. Eddie, how have you been? You and I have been super busy. I'm glad we're doing a show again. Yeah, it feels good to be back on the show. So it's, it's been a while. It feels like it's been forever. It's been, just been busy. Work, work, work. And just trying to work, 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 I guess. Nothing really too much going on with me. How about you, Mike? What's going on with you? What are you drinking, by the way, Mike? <laughs> I, I, we were talking about this, and so I, I, had, I had some Red Bull vodka uh, before the show uh, while I was waiting for you to finish up with your work, 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 because I've also been working a lot, too, but I'm off today. So I had that, and now I'm actually drinking some wine, so you can call me a wino. Uh, kind of gotten into that lately. Been trying to stay away from the, the beer and some of the other stuff. Trying to, you know, lose a, lose a little bit. But I, I don't want to give up my drinking. So I've uh, <laughs> kind of taken on wine lately. So I am a wino, unfortunately. <laughs> my buddy, he's, he's, been, uh, he's been dipping in wine a little bit. He mentioned it to me. But I'm not a wine drinker. I think the last time I had wine, I had like a, a crushing headache. So I just, I, yeah, I won't drink wine. So I'll be happy with the the seltzer I'm drinking right now is a Happy Dad seltzer. So the watermelon flavor. So that's doing justice. That's that's good right now for me. I'll, I'll pass on being a wino. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm down with the seltzers and watermelon is a good flavor for sure. So yeah, uh, same thing as you. Just been working a lot, but um, you know the Ducks uh, season concluded. Uh, we're gonna kind of cover that a little bit. Uh, plenty of off season stuff to talk about. Um, just, just crazy times. I uh, just want to remind you that we're part of the Old City Sports Network. And uh, if you want to check out one of our sponsors, Norse Beards, go on there and check them out for your grooming needs. OCS uh, is the uh, discount code. And you can get some money off uh, some of the grooming products they have. All right. So the Ducks season, they ended losing a bunch of games, which people wanted. And they did secure the first draft lottery spot. Uh, which is crazy, uh, but they, they were able to do it. Uh, it came down to almost the last day of the season, pretty crazy times, but uh, they ended up losing. It was actually the last uh, 13 games, and they eked it out past Chicago and Columbus. I went to fan appreciation night, and, and it was weird uh, trying to root against them at the end there because the Ducks got a power play at the end, and I, I didn't want them to score. It was very, very weird, and they didn't. They ended up losing. Then, obviously, they lost to the Kings, which that kind of sucked. I kind of wanted them to beat the Kings, but then I wanted to pick, and uh, that's where they ended up. So it was very weird. I, I felt weird the last couple weeks of the season, Eddie. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't recall a time where I actually like wanted the Ducks to lose, but... Uh, we knew these games were meaningless, and they ended up getting you know that first draft lottery spot. So you know they secured a top three pick overall, and and, and that uh, you know made me happy in that regard. Oh yeah, that's really important. The whole Connor Bedard sweepstakes, just to have the the best opportunity of landing something a generational talent like that. And the Ducks have never had a first overall draft pick in, in franchise history. So if uh, if the, the the balls or whatever they they help do behind the scenes, swing right. Come May 8th, then we might get that first overall. But, yeah, it felt kind of weird having to cheer against the Ducks or when the Ducks scored a goal, you're like, damn it, or they went to overtime, you're, I'm all pissed off. And then against the Kings, too, I didn't even watch the last game of the season because I was watching a part of it, and I'm like, you know what, I want them to lose, and I just feel bad watching it, wanting them to lose. It was just one of those, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't really explain it, but I, I'm glad they did lose and they kind of just went out that bad way. So hopefully... Uh, our answers will be will be pr our prayers will be answered come May eighth in the the draft lottery. Hopefully, it goes in our favor and we get the first overall pick. Yeah, absolutely. I I felt the same way too watching. I I you know I don't like losing to the Kings. We've talked about that. I don't like losing to the Sharks. But I mean, no one's going to remember this game. You know, we we're, no one's going to care about the last couple of weeks of the season. They're just going to want to know you know where we end up in the draft lottery and who we get. So 
Um, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but I, I put down some of the stuff that we talked about that happened at the beginning of the season, or I should say our predictions at the beginning of the season, and we were, we were kind of right, we were kind of wrong, uh, so I just wanted to recap that real quick, and then we'll go into everything else, but uh, we thought the Ducks would not make the playoffs, so we, you know, we were correct on that. We did think that maybe they would be maybe 9th, 10th, or 11th in the Western Conference. We, we certainly didn't think they were going to be last. I don't think anybody thought that, but that's what happened. Uh, one of them, I, I, I think this was more me. I thought Strom and Vetrano would both get 20 goals. We saw Vetrano do it, but not Strom. And then Klingberg, big disappointment. We, we thought he was going to play pretty well for the, the team. You know, we were pretty sure he was going to get traded at the deadline, which happened, but then the return wasn't as good. So uh, we kind of won some, we lost some with some of our predictions, Eddie. I don't remember if there was anything else that you can recall that, that we thought was going to happen this season or not happen and, and how it turned out. No, it kind of turned out how we predicted. Uh, the only downfall was Klingberg playing so horribly and not being able to get at least a first-round pick for him. I'm glad we got something for him, but he was a kind of a big disappointment uh, for the Ducks. So hopefully the Ducks, uh, it doesn't seem like they'll be in a playoff position come next season. You never know, though, how things change. Things things can always go crazy. I remember Colorado being that that worst worst franchise uh, loss uh, ever they had. They came back the next season and made playoffs. So you, you never know, but I'm not holding my breath on it. Um, hopefully they can just kind of just keep the rebuild process going. We get the first overall pick. We can sign a, a, a free agent that wants to prove himself for a one-year deal and hopefully flip him at the deadline and just keep stacking up on prospects and picks and just kind of getting this, this rebuild go faster and with those prospects and picks and Smart moves in free agency. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the show. Absolutely. The other part of this is now the the coaching front of this is uh, right after the season ended. Dallas Akins was not brought back. He he could have been you know uh, brought back for one year. He was not. You had Roy Sommer. He did not come back as the goals coach, which was was kind of known um, that he was brought in for one season. So now the Ducks are looking for an AHL and an NHL coach. Uh, the interesting thing is with Dallas, he knew in advance that he was not coming back. I actually had a couple people hit me up on April Fool's Day, the first, and tell me that he was looking for commentator uh, positions. And I, I kind of was hesitant because it was April Fool's. I thought they were playing jokes on me, so I didn't really say anything. Uh, some other people were told not to say anything either, so I kind of waited. And I posted something on uh, social media, I, I want to say maybe the, that weekend after the season, uh, just recently about him looking for those spots. But... Uh, as far as I know, at the beginning of April, he was looking for other positions, one of them possibly being uh, with ESPN. I heard that he's been talking to them. I don't know if that's going to pan out, but that that's one that he has looked into. So he's not, not coming back. And, and it wasn't really a big surprise. I think some people were, but most of us weren't. When they had the season ticket holder event with Verbeek, uh, he had talked about, I'm not going to evaluate things till the end of the season. He hadn't talked to Dallas Akins about extension and all that. Kind of the writing was on the wall. So it were, it really wasn't a big surprise to me, Eddie, that he didn't come back. It's unfortunate that they lost those last 13 games in a row and it kind of went on a you know tailspin. But, uh, you know, they, they lost those games and that's what happened. Uh, they just they ended up getting the first round pick. So it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it, it wasn't a surprise that he's gone as a, a head coach. I kind of feel for him. He, he just got handed a team that, that wasn't going to really have success. And the second time in his coaching or head coaching career, he just kind of handed teams that were kind of a set for failure. So I, I really feel for him. But he was a great players coach, and I think he developed our, our young guns the right way, and he did an amazing job with having them find their games. Uh, look at Troy uh, Terry becoming a superstar. You see uh, Trevor Zegers becoming that franchise player. It's just Things like that, he, he did a great job with. Unfortunately, like I said, he, he didn't really uh, be in a position for success when he had, uh, got handed this team. But we all knew Verbeek, too, wanted to, a new GM. going to want his own coach and want to have his own influence on the team. So it was no surprise. That I, I wish him like nothing but the best of luck, and hopefully he lands a good commentating job. And I definitely 100% keep supporting him. Ducks fly the, together forever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, there, and there's some other names that have come up two uh for this team uh with the coaching thing they uh, uh you've had uh elliot freeman and merrick and them talking about some of these names we had a fan question too that asked uh let's see here we've we've got uh johansson lewis he asked you know is verbeek considering taking interest 
um, or who is who is he taking interest in? He, he says, "I hope it's not Carlisle or Boudreaux." Yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to repeat for sure. Definitely not. And then we had uh, Adam T Town asked about Joe Sacco, which I thought was interesting because that's the Colorado connection. He he did very well there in the uh, first season with the Avalanche, but then didn't do as well after that and ended up with uh, just under a 500 record. Obviously, he's at Boston, and Boston's doing great. He's been the assistant coach there for nine years, but you can't really give him all that credit uh, for that. So uh, that's a name that's been thrown out there. And then you've got Todd Nelson, Greg Cronin, and Matt McIlvain. So some other names we'll go into. But I, I guess we'll kind of start with Adam T. Town's question. What do you think about Joe Sacco, Eddie? I mean, I know you follow Colorado, too, and I, you know he was there, and now he's with Boston. Um, what is your take on him before we get to some of these other names? I, I mean, I, I get it. He has that that winning mentality right now, being with Boston, uh, Boston's powerhouse of a team over there. He didn't do great at all with Colorado, and some of his coaching decisions and things he did were just kind of questionable. I, I was stationed over there, so I got to go to a lot of practices and, and watch that team while he was coaching it. So I, I mean, I, I would pass on him. And then, and honestly, you have to look – do you think he's going to want to come to a team with the roster that we have right now? I, I think I, I want to say it's safe to say we're about two or three years away from a playoff spot, correct, Mike? Yeah, I, yeah, I would say at I least two or three years for sure. Years. I agree with you. It's like it, it's going to be his, his, I guess, his second time being a head coach and trying to find success. And I don't think he wants to go the the Dallas Aikens way, where you just got uh, promoted to head coach of a team that is it's kind of destined for failure. I don't think it's really going to be fair for him, and it's that's. But that's your last chance. You either have success or you don't. I, I think he would he would pass on the opportunity to, to come and be a head coach for the Ducks, too. Yeah, I'm with you, too. I mean, he's been with Boston for those nine years. They made the playoffs the last seven years in a row. Yeah, I just don't see it. I think he'd want to stay there, too, instead of trying to come to the situation in Anaheim, like you said. I think some of the other names that are interesting that uh, were mentioned on the Jeff Merrick Show and the 32 Thoughts podcast were Todd Nelson and Greg Cronin. And it was interesting because they talked about both of these guys and they talked about developing players, getting them to play hard. Uh, Elliot Freeman talked about the Ducks having more grease to their lineup. And I thought that was interesting because I, I think, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but you and I have talked about that at nauseum for the last couple of years. And the Ducks don't have that. You, you don't have these players. I mean, you have Carrick that goes out there and does some stuff. You have... Uh, Bo Yu that goes out there and, and hits uh, Benoit. So you have a few people and, uh, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. But I just thought it was interesting that they were hitting on the whole thing about, okay, they got to get a guy that's going to develop the players, which we saw Dallas Aikens do that. But then they want a, a coach that's going to get them to be more intense, I guess. So it's interesting. You have Todd Nelson. He's the current coach of the AHL Hershey Bears. Uh, he did replace Aikens. In Edmonton in 2014 and 15, he finished out that season, then became the assistant coach with Dallas up until 2022. So he's got experience at the NHL and AHL level. And Greg Cronin as well, too. He was assistant coach with the Leafs, the Islanders as well. And now he's been with the AHL Eagles since the 2018 season. So these are two names that they've thrown out there. I, I think they're kind of interesting um, what do you what do you think? I'll hold off uh, Matt McIlvain uh, for a second, but what do you think about these guys and kind of what they're talking about? I, I think almost like they're kind of on the same page that you and I are, Eddie, that this team needs a little bit more grease or grit. Oh, yeah, definitely. We, 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 have, to, we have to beef things up a little bit more. You can't have uh, players taking liberties at Zegris or Terry. Or, or you can't, like that last game against the Kings when Terry uh, laid that hit and then he... Um, you have Terry, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Zegers laid a hit and he got like attacked. You have Terry jumping in there. It's like you can't have your superstar right there risking injury and fighting. You need those, those tough guys still, those like not enforcer kind of guys, but those kind of the, the grinders, those people that are going to kind of make you pay if you take liberties that are star players. And that's like, so I know that the whole league is changing and, and it's getting watered down a lot. And slowly those players, those kind of players are getting phased out of it, but you still need those on the ice. I think. Take a look, for example, uh, the Dallas and Minnesota series. That that th those teams for some reason just seem to hate each other. But you have a guy like Ryan Reeves out there. It's like okay, if, if you're gonna take liberties at at Kaprizov or, or one of my players, then you have to deal with me. It just that will kind of make players from other teams think twice about taking liberties and kind of get them not really scared, but like keep their head up a little like more than usual, not just 
think they can just like run amok and do stupid crap like that to our players on the ice. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to the Ducks team, you know, that won in 2007, you had guys on there that did do that. I mean, you you, you had um, May on there. You had uh, Chris Pronger. You had guys that would go out there and lay the body. And, and, and Peros, exactly. You had you had guys that would do things like that. Uh, even young Getzloff playing on the fourth line. I mean, he, he would go at people. I mean... That's what the Ducks had, and you still have to have some of those guys on the team. I'm not saying you got to get a knuckle dragger, a guy that's just going to fight all the time necessarily, but you have to have some tough guys. If you look at the playoffs right now, it, these series are all crazy. You look at all the stuff going on. The, uh, you talked about Dallas and Minnesota. Wow, that series has been extremely intense. Look at Edmonton and the Kings. They're going at it big time. I mean, you know, playoff hockey... Yes, you have to have the skilled players. You have to have those guys that are going to you know, produce the goals and win. You have to have an outstanding goaltender. Absolutely. But you've also got to got to have those guys that are going to take the hits, going to stand up for your players, uh, establish the forecheck, and have that grit. So I think they're on the right path when they're talking about coaches uh, coming in to fix this team. And they talked about Nelson and Cronin. I, I, I like both those choices. I, I think they're guys that can come in and help this team. I'm really curious about Matt McIlvain. I have to tell you, I wasn't, I didn't know much about him until they talked about him on their show. But I think it's interesting. There's a little short YouTube video. I posted it on our uh, goals by leak we final report that Thomas wrote. I, I kind of added a little bit in there, but I put that. If you want to watch, there's a YouTube link in that article, about three minutes. It's very, very good. I, I like. The, you know, just his mindset. He's talking about this kind of this formula. He talks about performance and how it equals capabilities, which is talent, as he calls it, and behavior, which is how you act, think, and and, and work. And, and I mean, it's common sense stuff. It's it's not rocket science. But the way he talks about it, he talks about coming into a team, taking a player survey, getting to know everybody, and and getting everybody on the same page, getting everybody to collaborate, get uh, also. Uh, ownership, people to buy in. Like, how, do, how? What do you want the team to be? How do you want the team to win? Uh, and I think it's it's huge. And they were saying that Verbeek is looking at this guy, Matt McElvain, to come in at the AHL level for the Ducks. And it was kind of interesting. They talked about uh, Elliot Freeman was a little bit surprised. He thought maybe Akins would stay another season at the NHL. McElvain would come in at the AHL and then replace Akins maybe in like a year or so. Which is interesting, but I like this guy. I mean, you know, watching the videos, there's other ones that you can check out on YouTube and whatnot. Um, he's currently in Austria coaching. He's got a 60, 28, and 8 record in the last two years there coaching the team that he, you know, he's, he's been doing. So I don't know if he's the front runner or whatnot, but obviously. Uh, Elliot Freeman said that Verbeek has talked about him and bringing him in. So I like this guy. I, I, I kind of want him to come in just as the Ducks coach. But uh, if he comes to the HL, I'd be okay with that. I, I just think that this guy is one that can help the Ducks uh, take it to the next level. And just, and just the brief things that I've seen, Eddie, I'm really big on him. You know what? Yeah, th that video was a really, really good video. Um, it, it, it motivated the hell out of me just listening to it. So, yeah, he'd be a good candidate. So hopefully the Ducks can land him, get him in the AHL, get him some experience with – North America hockey and and he can get promoted to a team and take them to the next level. Aikens too, I'll probably get ridiculed for this, but I I wouldn't have mind him staying one more year as a, a Ducks head coach. I think he's a great players coach and he knows how to develop our, our young guns or young stars. Man, he, he I think he just did a really good job with that at that uh, aspect of it. Like I said, I don't think the Ducks are going to be competitive or be in a playoff position next season, so why not just keep him around for one more year and just him have uh, him having those relationship with the players and develop them a little bit longer would have been good for me like i wouldn't have been like th like too pissed off about that but i i'm sure ducks fan base would have lost their minds and pitchforks would have been at honda center yeah you know that was the sad thing eddie is that when it was announced that he wasn't coming back some people said that oh Dallas Akins was fired which actually is not true he wasn't technically fired he had an extension the extension was not renewed so you can kind of calm yourself with that and i i just i don't know i don't celebrate people you know having their job lost I, I i don't know i just i just think that's the wrong way to go about it and i'm with you the players all respected him he's a very big players coach 
and he did develop the players. That was another thing that Elliot Freeman had talked about on their show too, is that, I mean, you look at, at, at the way Terry and Zegras and uh, uh, McTavish as well, uh, they all improved this season. They all did. Whether you like Dallas Aikens or not, or or you want to talk about how the Ducks, you know, had a crappy record, obviously being, you know, the worst team in the league record-wise, but the young players did make strides. They made strides under him when he was in San Diego. They made strides under him this year uh, in the NHL level. So I, I'm with you too. If they would have brought him back another year, McIlvain under the uh, AHL and then flopped him in a year, I wouldn't have been upset with that. But a lot of people, you know, uh, harp on him and give him a hard time, which I get. There's some things I didn't like uh, the way he would do the lineup. We've talked about that. I didn't think it was always optimized to be the best. I mean, we can agree on that. That was one of his big faults. Yeah, I'm, and I'm with you. And some teams can pull that off. Some teams can do the 11-7 deal, right? They, they can work that, but the Ducks couldn't do that. And, and yeah, I wasn't happy with that at all as far as the lineup trying to trying to play that seventh defenseman and trying to make it work. It, it, it just didn't work for the team. But the other problem with the Ducks the, is, let's be honest, the Ducks' defense was horrible this year. I mean, you had Cam Fowler being the, the leading defenseman on the, on the, the blue line. And after that, the drop-off was huge. I mean, granted, Drysdale got hurt and he was out. Klingberg didn't make make it to be what he wanted to be. Uh, Vaka Nainen was in and out with injuries too. So he had some of that too. Not making excuses, just talking about the situation, the way it was. But the Ducks' blue line was just disgusting. It was horrible this year. And the Ducks gave up the most shots on goal in an 82 regular season game, or excuse me, season, uh, ever. I, I mean, it, it, that's that's crazy. Uh, so, uh, are there things that Aikens did wrong? Of course. Is he perfect? No. But I, I think if the Ducks would have had a better blue line, maybe things would have been a little bit different. I, I don't know. But I, either way, he's he's gone. The Ducks, you know, have this top three pick. Um, so now they're gonna have to figure out the coaching situation. I guess you have to bring in. So those were the names that were thrown out recently. Uh, like I said, Adam T Town also mentioned Joe Sacco, uh, which was good. I, I like that when people throw out other names. But uh, I think there was another name too that you had talked about, Eddie. There was another coach from another team that you thought maybe the Ducks should look at. Oh, Peter Laviolette. He got let go by uh, by Washington this season. He was a he coached the the Nashville Predators for a while. He had some some kind of success. Obviously, the, the Capitals not making the playoffs. And going that route probably led to him being dismissed as a head coach. But that's someone that, that, that's that been around the block. And I've read about how he had like special connection with his players. He's like a player's coach, which it seems like in, in today's NHL, you have to be a, a player's coach to your players and not just be that that, that Tortorello kind of uh, coach, which I still love him. He's awesome and he's, he's no filter. But, yeah, I think that's another one the Ducks should be looking at. But, like I said, why uh, – would a uh, coach like his caliber, which he, he could still get jobs in a lot of uh, a lot of teams, but like, why would he want to kind of take under a team that's was dead last in the league and doesn't seem like it's going to have success for a couple more years? Yeah, I think that's the question. Anybody that comes in, they're going to have to know the situation uh, and and how it's going to pan out. The other thing too, I kind of didn't like this, but the uh, at the end of the season they interviewed. Pat Verbeek and, and Lisa Dillman asked him some questions about self-reflection, and Verbeek kind of pushed back. And I, I, I kind of didn't like that part of it. I, I mean, I liked Verbeek for the most part, but uh, he was kind of dismissive of any self-reflection on his part. And I, I don't know, that, that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way because... I mean, granted, you're given this situation. It, it wasn't, you know, you didn't develop this situation. You, it was handed to you from from Murray and whatnot. But I don't know. It just kind of took me back. He was kind of standoffish and kind of like, well, I haven't done self-reflection kind of a thing. And it's like, well, dude, uh, you know this team is not doing well. You want a coach that uh, is your choice to mold this team but at, at some point, you have to look at yourself, too, in the mirror and see what you could have done better. I mean, are there things that Verbeek could have done better this season? You know, maybe there are some things that he could have done to make this team a little better. Maybe he could have done some stuff at the trade deadline. I don't know. I mean, and now we've got the off season where I have to figure out uh, what's going to happen with free agency and the draft and things like that. So 
I think anybody that comes in is going to have to, you know, like you said, okay, this team is at the bottom. They're a couple years away from being a a contender. But then you've got a guy that's the GM that uh, doesn't want to look himself in the mirror and and check himself. I I mean, nothing. I like Verbeek and I like what he's done so far, but I I don't know. That just kind of rubbed me the wrong way, Eddie. Oh, you're 100% right. Like, you're the GM of the team. Like, you're the leader. Like, it's attitude reflect like leadership. You have to just, you have to look in the mirror. You have to have that self reflection. Like, okay, what can I have done better? Like, you're not, per- you're, like, you're definitely not perfect. Your team was dead last in the entire <laughs> entire league. So, obviously, there, there, there's some reflection that he needed to be uh, done to himself. And him just being standoffish, maybe he was just, uh, he's having an off day, but still, you, you're a GM of a hockey club and you're supposed to just, I, Take some responsibility for it, not just act like you're you're perfect. Because I mean, number thirty two in the standings, definitely something that you could have done better. The deadline could have been better. Uh, think uh, maybe the Klingberg signing. You could have brought someone else in that would have fit the mold better and and got a better return at a different player at the deadline. So there's, there's a lot he could self reflect on and a lot, a lot he can improve on. So I think that's something that hopefully he was having just an off day, a bad day. Like we all, like, like no one's perfect, but and I really hope that he looks in the mirror and has some self-reflection and, and kind of mold this team to a championship team soon one day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before we get to, you know, basically the second half, we've got a, a lot of stuff to talk about in the future. Just remember we're part of the Old City Sports Network. Uh, Righteous Felon is one of the sponsors. They have really good beef jerky. Check them out. RighteousFelon.com, OCSN for a discount. And then all our other uh, sponsors are in the description box. So check them out. Um, so, so now, you know, with the team, we turn the page. Uh, you know, May 8th can't come soon enough. Everybody's excited. The Ducks will be guaranteed a top three pick in this draft. There's a little bit of confusion about the percentages. But the Ducks have a one in four chance, basically, of getting the first overall pick, just over 25%. Some numbers out there were 18%. Uh, the reason for that is the way it's set up is you you have uh, teams 12 through 16 that could win, quote unquote, the draft, but they can only move up 10 spots. So basically, it's teams one through 11 that have the chance at, at, at that first overall pick. And if the Ducks don't get the first pick, then they can get the second or third at worst. So uh, a good thing there. And, and you've got Columbus and Chicago in the mix as well. So we had you know questions about that. Uh, uh, some of the fans asked, we had uh, Chris J. Campos asked, you know, will the first round pick uh, make the club next season? I, I, I think there's a good chance, especially if the Ducks are first and they get Bedard. I think there is a good chance that, that he could make uh, the team and play next season. We've seen that happen before. So there's also some other good picks in there, too, for second or third. So I really do think there's a good chance of that. Uh, and that's what also Puck Luck 17 asked, too. You know, uh, they'll actually, uh, they asked a little, little variation of that. They talked about which prospects that we think could make it out of the Ducks training camp. So not necessarily maybe the draft pick, but other players. And, uh, there's some other ones on, on the horizon. I mean, you had Lacombe that got to play at the end of the season. Nestorenko, which I really liked. I liked his speed, his transition game. Bo Grew. You had Zellweger that uh, that went off this last week. He had a hat trick. And uh, I guess I thought it was three assists, but I guess he had four assists. They gave him another one. I mean, he's been disgusting. So I know they're trying to slow roll defensemen, but good Lord, Zellweger has been awesome. Uh, Minta Kulov. And then you had Hellison that also played some of the games this season. So those are some of the players that I would think, Eddie, to look forward to uh, coming up the season. You know, what do you think? You, you think the Ducks get Bernard? You know, he's gonna he's gonna play, or you think that they they you know get the second or third pick that that person will will play next season? I think there's a good chance. I don't know. I'm a little stressed out and nervous about May 8th. I'm not really excited because if the Ducks don't get the number one overall pick, I'm gonna be super pissed off. Like it's like all that. All the suffering that we as fans had to deal with this season and us having most of the fans cheering for the Kings to beat the Ducks and fan appreciation night hoping the Ducks would lose. Just, and it's like, man. But you know what, too? I, I wanted to mention, too, I wanted to mention earlier about this whole tanking thing, is uh, too. I know people a lot of uh, always like, talk about tanking for Bedard. These players don't tank. You can ask Johnny Gaudreau because his whole fan base absolutely hated him. When he scored that overtime winning goal to get those, <laughs> secure those two points, and then 
all the <laughs> Columbus Blue Jackets fans were cheering for the Ducks. <laughs> the Ducks versus Kings. I saw a lot of them post on the Ducks like, oh, go Ducks, beat the Kings, beat the Kings. The whole city of Columbus and all their fans became Ducks fans when they played the Kings, hoping that they would uh, they would lose, but or they would win the game and hop above Columbus, so Columbus would be that, that, that lower spot. But fortunately, the Stars were aligned for the Ducks to, to lose that game, and it's going to be interesting come May 8th, and I really hope once he he puts that card and shows it, it's, it's the Ducks right there. Ducks get number one overall pick, and definitely Bredar will be playing for the for the big club next season if he gets picked up by the Ducks. Yeah, I think the big thing is is uh, a lot of people are already talking about if the Ducks don't get the first pick, they're going to lose their mind, which I, I, I get it. I'm with you too, Eddie. It's like, oh my God, dude, we lost all these games. We, you know, we, we played, we had just, it was a rough year. Let's be honest. It's a rough year for all of us, for you, me, all of you listening. We, like, it was a rough year. I mean, there's just no, let's just, <laughs> you can't beat around the bush, right? But I think what would make this worse and I'm not saying it's rigged or whatever, but if Chicago gets that pick, I am going to be legit pissed off. I mean, I know Kane went to New York. I know Tapes had his issue and he's gone. But I don't care about the Blackhawks. I, I, I could care less. If they get that pick instead of Columbus or the Ducks, I, I'm going to lose my mind. At it. If Columbus gets in, we're second. I won't be as mad. But if Chicago gets that pick... Uh, I, I don't know, dude. I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying it's rigged, but I'm going to lose my shit, Eddie. Eddie. I might say it's rigged. I don't give a shit. I mean, <laughs> why, can't, why can't you show from start to finish of what's going on? Like, like, like what's the so secret? Like, why can't you have like, a, little, a little live feed going on? I'm sure you could have some advertisers like on there that, 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 that pay you to be advertised on there. You make some money. All us crazy fans will be happy just watching stupid little lottery balls just pop back and forth and... Just so we can know 100% and we can just end that whole rig discussion. But, but like, you know, you made a good point too. And I was going to say this when you were talking, but you said it. I mean, I'd be pissed off the Ducks didn't get the number one overall pick. But I wouldn't be mad if Columbus got it. Like, they've dealt with a lot in their organization. I, I don't know. I think the, their fan base would deserve that too. But I, I still just, I'd still be upset if the Ducks didn't uh, get uh, the number one overall pick. But I'd be just absolutely pissed off. And I think the whole hockey community, besides the city of Chicago, would just light the whole world on fire if Chicago gets that first overall pick. Or Arizona. Every like Everyone talks about that's Gary Bettman's baby right there. And if, 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 if Arizona happens to get that first overall pick, then definitely people are going to be like, it's rigged, it's rigged, it's rigged. Uh, yeah, that would be crazy if Arizona got it. But you're right. Uh you know, just so everybody knows, I'm looking at the little chart right here, and I'm telling you about the team. So, you, you know, you've got the Ducks, 25%, Columbus, 13.5%, Chicago, 11.5%, Sharks, 9.5%, Montreal, 8.5%, and then Arizona at 7.5%, Philly, 6.5%, Washington, 6 Detroit, 5 St. Louis at 35 and then uh, Vancouver rounds that out at 3% chance. So those are your teams. Uh, the, those are the, the ones that could win the draft lottery and get the first pick. And then your teams on the outside, you got Ottawa, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Nashville, and Calgary, who uh, they could win, but they could only move up 10 spots. So that's kind of where we're at. And and you brought up another point, too. I, for, I forgot to talk about it, too, but you're right with Columbus. Those fans were legit losing their mind when they won and then the Ducks lost those last two games. Like, they were going berserk on social media. They were so sad that <laughs> that they went higher than the Ducks and did not end up in that first draft lottery position. So crazy, Eddie, to think about that when you have three fan bases that are hoping to lose and get the first draft lottery pick. I mean, it's crazy. We've never been in this position before with the Ducks. Super weird. Like I said, at that Vancouver fan appreciation night, I, I, I was like, oh my God, they got a power play at the end. I'm like, you assholes better not score. Don't score. Don't score. And, I, and I'm there with my, my better half. And, she, and I'm explaining it to her. And she's like, really? I'm like, yes. I go, honey, we don't, we don't want them to score. We want them to lose. And she's like, what? I go, we, we want to get the first draft lottery pick uh, position. Not you know, not guaranteed the first pick per se, but she was laughing, she was cracking up. She's like, You you never root against the ducks. I'm like, I know, but this is like a weird like 
circumstance in the universe. <laughs> so, I mean, what a what a crazy finish for those three fan bases, Eddie. And, I, and I'm with you. I mean, just nuts. And, and, and yes, if Columbus ends up getting it, I won't be so mad. But please, don't. Chicago gets that thing. I, I'm going to lose it. And and they can make money off of this, like you talked about, Eddie. If they did, like, the, the Mega uh, Lotto and all these other lotteries, and they had, like, the thing aired, and they had all the balls dropping all this, dude, they could make tons of money because they could slow roll it. They could post advertisements, right? They could do, like, oh, they got 10th. Okay, commercial. They got 9th. Oh, commercial. Like, they could totally drag it out and make a crap ton of money. Instead of instead of just flipping these little cards and going, yeah, tenth, ninth, okay, now we're down to third, and uh, well, whoever gets second, the other team gets first. I mean, you know what I mean? I I don't know. I just think that they could really market the hell out of it and make a crap ton of money, which they won't. They won't listen to you or I. But I, I think you had a good point there. Oh yeah, it's just ah man. I look at the calendar: Monday, May eighth. It's either going to be a, a black Monday or an orange Monday. So that's going to be just stressful and. Oh, man. But, yeah, the, those Columbus fans are really losing their mind. When Goudreau sc- uh, scored that overtime winning goal, it was just like Twitter w- exploded with Columbus fans, just pissed off, all mad. And But, yeah, you know, can you imagine us getting the first overall pick, having Bedard with, with Zegris, with Terry, with Tavish? M- McTavish will probably be in, in the running for the Calder Trophy. I, I don't think he wins it. I think he'll be top three. I think Bernier's over there in Seattle really took off and elevated his game to be the best rookie of the league. But I think uh, McTavish will be the top three in the running for it, so that's good. But like, I guess what I'm hearing about Bedard and the videos I've been watching, he can accelerate this rebuild and he can actually change the whole culture and history of, of, of Anaheim Ducks hockey. And it's just going to be really, oh, if we get him, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be one step closer to ending this whole drought that we have, this, this this playoff thing that we have, we can probably make the playoffs maybe less than the two to three years, maybe in the, the year following after his first season. I mean, I mean, look what Crosby did. Crosby, the first season, yeah, they, they didn't make playoffs, but after that, he just he changed the whole outcome of the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey club, and they became elite and dominant. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got other players out there doing it too. you got Connor McDavid doing his thing at Edmonton. I mean, you, you know, you've got guys that can turn around a franchise, and that's why... At the end, it was like, okay, we lost these last couple games. But I'm like, hey, if you can get a franchise guy that can turn your organization around for a decade, hey, I'll I'll take a couple more losses. I'm I'm good with that. So, so, well, with that, I mean, the other thing is, okay, the the Ducks got to figure out their coaching situation. We've talked about that. You know, you got the draft lottery coming up, like you said, Eddie. It's stressful, right? That Monday, May eighth. I'm really curious to see what happens. But then the other part of it is like, what what else do we do? What what do we do with these other players? And it, it's kind of funny because, again, Elliot Freeman on his Thirty Two Thoughts podcast was talking about trading. He's talking about uh, Henrik and Gibson names that have been thrown out there again. He's saying that Henrik's a player of interest. Teams. You know, might be interested in him. Do you trade him now? Do you trade him in the summer? Uh, later on, uh, you know, towards the the draft. Do you wait till next season? Uh, he talked about Gibson again, which I, I don't know why he keeps talking about Gibson. Verbeek already said that hey, you don't trade Gibson unless you have another elite goalie uh, to trade for or coming up. Which maybe Dossel is that person, maybe not. But those are thrown out there too. So. What do, you, what do you think? You think the Ducks are uh, trying to make some kind of trade here in the offseason? I mean, even if it, regardless if it's a Rico or Gibson or anybody, you, you, what, what, are your, what do you think? They're just going to try and do something that way to improve the team other than just, you know, okay, we'll draft lottery and, and you know, do the draft and whatnot. Oh, yeah, you have to figure out what direction you want your hockey club to, to go. I mean, someone like Rico, you could eat, you could eat some of his. Um, I think yeah, he had a good season. You could eat some of his contract. He's a one, uh, one, one more year left, and trade him for assets. Uh, if, if the right uh, trade is available, I'm sure he'll get lots, of, lots of interest. I, I wrote the article. I thought he would have been a good fit for Colorado. That that would have been good for him to be over there. But well, yeah, you you just have to look at what what uh, direction you want your team to go. Um, I mean. Bedard's a center too. If you, you end up drafting him, you're not going to stick him in a bottom six role. You're going to have him play that that top role. But yeah, um, 
I think he, he would go, and I, I really think, too, which we haven't really mentioned, I, I think we'll talk about that later, but the whole captain thing, too. You have to name a captain and, and have a, a voice for this team and someone that can lead it and start start, start trending that, uh, trending that way. I, I'm not a fan of these teams just going with three A's or, like, I think it was New York that has three different alternate captains when you go away, and then they have three different ones when you're home. It's just That's just too crazy. It's too many Chiefs, not enough Indians, but I think they have to name – like a bona fide leader that can actually lead this team to success. Yeah, you and I talked about that during the season. That Verbeek said that he wasn't going to do that until the end of the season, which he stuck to his guns. He did not pick a captain during. I know you and I did think about that, and we thought maybe he would pick somebody, even in the interim. You know, if he was going to give it to Terry or Zegers later on, like. You know, uh, give it to Fowler uh, for the rest of the season, or maybe next season, and then and then switch it over to one of them. Uh, we talked about Henrique, but yeah, they didn't. That was one thing that that was a little bit surprising. But I am curious to see what they're gonna do. Uh, we had Jay uh, Gamara uh, seven one four. You know, he asked about. Uh, you know, he thinks Gibson's gonna be traded. He talked about to Pittsburgh. Um, I, I don't know Pittsburgh. You know, it's my other team that I like, and and yeah, his name's been thrown around, but Pittsburgh just got like blown the f up. Uh, they didn't make the playoffs after what, like sixteen years or something like that, and they blew the team up. Uh, Burke's gone, Hextall's gone, Pryor's gone. I mean, they, they everybody but the coach. They just decided, you know, they went nuts, which I thought was crazy because it did come down to the end of the season. So, uh, you know. <sighs> I would have thought maybe before, okay, yeah, maybe Gibson could go to Pittsburgh. But now with with what's happened to that team not making the playoffs and then just the front office, just like literally a nuke being dropped <laughs> on the Pittsburgh front office, I, I don't see that happening. I, I just don't – I don't see Gibson getting traded in the summertime. Now, I now next season, Dostal comes in and Dostal starts kicking butt, which I think he will – Maybe that's when you do it. I, you know, I, I don't know. But again, I, I think this is where I do give Verbeek credit because he's like, hey, you don't just trade an elite goalie to get another goalie. Um, you got you got to bring in someone or develop somebody. So I don't see him going to Pittsburgh. I see uh, the Ducks waiting through the summer, uh, developing Dostal. Uh, unless something crazy happens and some other elite goalie becomes available, that's kind of my take on, on what I see with that. Because Pittsburgh is like, I mean, they're obviously more competitive than the Ducks are. That you know, they they've been in the playoffs so many years, and been up there. But holy crap, organizationally, they have a lot of restructuring going on. So I, I just don't see him going there, at least not now. Oh no, I I think after 16 years, I think it's. I know the uh, people of Pittsburgh, Mike, you probably don't want to hear this either, but I think a, a rebuild is, is in the, the whole near future with Pittsburgh. I mean, he had Crosby playing just lights out for, for his age, carrying the team on his back. Malkin had a pretty good season too, but I, I think for them, they're either going to try to retool or they're going to just try to rebuild because they have to build up their prospects. They have to just build that championship winning team that they had years ago. And I, I don't think Gibson will be that answer and, and to want to go over there and and do that. Uh, I I don't think Gibson's gonna go. I think the best way you would have traded him was a couple seasons ago when he was having he was playing lights out on this bad Ducks team. You could have fetched a, a hell of a lot of return for him and really got something. I, I just he hasn't had a good season. He's playing in front of a horrible team. He, 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 I don't think he's gonna would fetch that much right now if he if for beat did try to trade him. So I mean I would just stand put and let's see uh, how the draft goes and see if we can accelerate this rebuild. With, with, with a player like Bedard. But like you said, too, top three were guaranteed. I spoke with Thomas. I saw Thomas in our group chats. He's saying you can't go wrong with any of like those players. The top five players are going to be NHL caliber superstar players. So, I mean, I would just hold on to Gibson, see what, what Dostal has. I mean, he, he looked great the few games that he was in. He, he played really well despite being in front of a bad team and the, and the losses that he had. But... We should have seen what we have. If, if he just explodes this season, like, like like you said, Mike, then yeah, definitely you would consider trading Gibson and taking that route. Or if not, you can just have a 1A, 1B kind of goalie. So when you're ready to make the play or get back in the playoffs and be that competitive championship team, then you have two great goalies just in case an injury happens or something. Yeah, and, and I'm fine with that. I mean, you've got Dossel as an RFA this season, so they own the rights. They can bring him back. You know, for one year or a couple of years and not cost too much and you could still keep Gibson. So I, I'm okay with that. You know, and that's that's the thing that the Ducks got to figure out in this offseason. They've got so much cap space, so much stuff to, to figure out. 
um, with this team. I, I think they ended the season with about 14 million in cap space, which was like one of the highest in the league, if not the highest. But they've got to figure some stuff out. You've got uh, those contracts with uh, Zegris and Terry and Drysdale, the big three you've got to figure out. You've got Comtois, who you and I thought was going to be traded at the deadline. He's at $2 million. He's an RFA. So I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen with him. And then you've got Benoit on defense as an RFA. And then we also mentioned Dost as well. So they got to figure all this stuff out, too. Uh, and, and that's what we had. Yo, hey, it's Chris on Instagram. Ask you know, there's a lot of roster spots left. Some fr- you know free agent defensemen. You know, what do the Ducks do? Well, that's what the Ducks have to do first. They've got to figure out what they're going to do with these RFAs. I, you know, I think they're going to bring most of them back. I think Zegris and Terry and Drysdale shall all get paid. Uh, of the three, maybe Drysdale gets a bridge deal. I mean, he was hurt the last year. Uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Eddie, but I definitely think uh, Terry and Zegris are going to get big contracts. Oh, yeah. You know, we're, we're on the same page, too, because, like, when you were talking right now, I was uh, I was thinking about Drysdale. I was like, oh yeah, with the injury happened, there, there's no way they're gonna sign him long term. Uh, a bridge deal would be safe for both sides. He can kind of prove. I mean, we, we we know his skill level and his potential, so he can go out there and prove it and get that big contract that I'm I'm sure he'll end up earning by his play. But it safeguards the the Ducks too. You don't want to sign a player as a, a long term contract if he's gonna get injured and and not really like succeed and be that 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 star defenseman that we think he is is going to be and we, we saw this the sample size of him and his play he, he's a great defenseman so we just to see if he can get past the injury stuff because going out a whole season was really kind of tough but yeah i could see a bridge deal going down for drysdale um zegris and terry yeah they, they both need to get paid the whole thing about the contract too i, I was like uh, reading other stuff i, I people were or someone mentioned and i totally forgot who it was i should have written Wrote it down, so my, my bad for not giving credit. But they kind of compared him to um, Jack Hughes from New Jersey and the, the kind of payment that he might get uh, in his next deal. Um, Jack Hughes is getting around $8 million per season for the next, what, eight years, I believe. Um, I think that would be safe and fair for te- or for Zegers to get that kind of money. And it, it's, it, it wouldn't be a, a gamble on him. Like, we've already seen him just keep getting better and better each season. Uh, Terry, well, I, I, Terry would be another one too. I think around the same seven point five eight million dollar contract. I think would be fair for Terry. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I mean, I, I saw some of those comparisons too, and I forgot, like you said, who who said them. But yeah, I, I, I think in the ballpark of both those numbers for Terry and Zegers for sure. And like you said, it was unfortunate with Drysdale getting hurt, so they'd have to kind of work that out. But I, I, I think that would be fair. Uh, and then, you know, the biggest thing is the blue line. We talked about, you know, trying to fix this. If you look at the Ducks' blue line, you have Shattenkirk, that's an unrestricted free agent, at $3.9 million. You have Bull Yu, that's, you know, just under a million. Harrington, just under a million. Uh, what are they going to do with all these guys? Who are they going to pick up? And that's what some, some of you have asked, too, is like, well, who are the Ducks going to get? Who are they going to pick up? Well, they got to figure this stuff out. I mean, you've, you've got Fowler, right? I think Lacombe is going to probably make the team next season. You have White. And that's it. You only got three guys, Eddie. Kind of crazy on the defense. Well, and and Drysdale. So you got four. I mean, that's slim pickings. Yeah, that just says that something has to something has to give. You have to for free agency or if you want to just trust the younger defensemen. Zalwiger is coming up. Obviously, he exploded with those seven points you talked about earlier. Why not give them some exposure on a team? Just get them some 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 hockey experience at the National Hockey League level. And not just send them down to the AHL, and maybe they can develop better playing with a big club. Yeah, I, I mean that's something to look at if they don't want to rush them or not. But then, then you know they're going to have to look at the UFAs uh, and kind of looking at cap friendly. There's names out there. There's some. There's some guys they can go for. I mean, you, you've got uh, Dumba's going to be out there. Johnson, Orloff, uh, you know, uh, Severson. You got lots of names. Um, on here, Ian Cole. I mean, there's a there's a bunch. Gudis, uh, Kulikov. Obviously, they traded. Probably can bring him back. But if you look at cap friendly under the uh, UFAs in the season, there's there's a, there's a ton that they can bring. It, it's just going to be a matter of the money because they've got to figure out how much they're going to pay all these guys. I think uh, Comtois is a big question mark. What are you going to do? You know, he's an RFA. You got you got to bring him back for close to that two million mark. Is that something that they're going to want to do? I, I don't know because. 
You've got Henrique tied up at, at 5.8, Silverberg at 5.2, Strom at 5, and Bertrano at 3.6. Those are your big ones there. And I, I don't know. I mean, and if you're going to try to move Henrique or Silverberg, we've talked about this before, you get to try and retain some salary or whatnot. Um, so I think the big thing is get your RFAs figured out. You know, pay Zegers and Terry, get Drysdale locked up, get Dossel locked up too. Uh, Benoit, however, whatever they're going to do for that. And then and Comtois might be the odd man out, out of that group. Figure that out and then move from there and, and see what you're going to do with these contracts. Um, you know, because we had another person ask XXITZ, S-A-B-X-X, you know, thought about Rico getting traded. He thought maybe he got hurt before the deadline. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't think he necessarily got hurt. I mean, maybe, maybe he decided to sit out a few games or something like that, but... I do like Henrique. I, I think he's the guy that can help this team still next year. So I, I would keep him around for uh, next season and maybe trade him at the deadline next year and, and retain something, I, you know, and help him develop some of the players in the beginning of the season. But I don't know. Maybe something comes uh, during the off season. And there's a, you know a deal to be made, and, and you could pick him up, and, and he can uh, you know help another team, and, and then that clear some cap and bring people in. But uh, I'm really curious to see because, you know, you look at the center position for the Ducks right now. You've got Henrique, you've got Strom, you've got Lundestrom, uh, you've got Nestorinko who's coming up. I like him a lot. Uh, Zegras, obviously. I mean, the Ducks aren't aren't necessarily hurting at the center position right now. Um, so, I mean, if they did trade Henrique, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. The forward situation for the Ducks, I don't really worry about that too much. I, I'm just more concerned with the blue line right now because... They just don't. They don't have anybody. I mean, your top four defensemen. You have Fowler and Drysdale, and then that's it. You don't have anybody else after that, Eddie. So I think the defense is still uh, the biggest concern here. Yeah, we get the two million back in cap space from Corey Perry's uh, buyout too. That ends this year, so we have that extra two million that we can spend and use. So that's one thing. You, know, I wouldn't mind having Dmitry Kulikov come back to the team. I, I think he was really underrated when they they, they got him from Minnesota. Um, I, I think he played well. Uh, I had zero expectations from him, but I think when he was on the blue line, it, it helped the Ducks out a lot, and he made a lot of smart plays, and he was at that defensive defense and that, that was stay-at-home defenseman that we needed. I wouldn't mind having him back to help out our, our blue line next season either. Yeah, I liked what he did on the team. You know, I, I kind of didn't want that trade to happen. I mean, it, you know, they got the the pick out of that. But, yeah, I mean, to bring him back. Uh, you know, the other one I forgot to mention, too, in there is Vaca And, you know, I forgot. He's also an RFA, but not till the following season. So you do have him back in the mix, too. I forgot, I forgot to bring that up. So, I mean, that helps. But he's also been injury prone, too. So... Um, that's kind of the issue there. I, I did like Hellison too. We had, we had, um, uh, a fan question. It's, it's kind of, you know, we had a bunch of extra fan questions, which we'll finish the show with, but we had Tom, our, our man from England, you know, he asked about what's, what's your favorite game that you went to this season. Uh, in terms of ducks, I, I did like that fan appreciation game against Vancouver. And that's when Hellison got his first NHL goal and Lacombe played his first NHL game. So, uh, I see that in the mix. I mean, if the Ducks don't go out in free agency and get nuts and go after some of these high high, high priced names that I mentioned, then maybe you have Hellison playing on the team. Maybe you have Lacombe playing on the team. Maybe, like you talked about, you do bring up Zellwinger. I mean, this guy is just killing it. And then you got Mintakulov as well. I mean, I know that a lot of the talk has been, oh, they're going to be on the team in two, three years, but maybe not. Maybe the, some of those guys make the team next season because. If the Ducks don't bring back Shattenkirk, uh, your only veteran presence on that blue line really is Cam Fowler. There's no one else. These are all new guys or, or fairly young guys. I mean, Bolu's 30, but uh, you know he, he's not a guy with a lot of NHL experience. The rest of the, the, the blue line's pretty young. So that's what I'm curious to see is if they will go out and try and pick up one of these uh, free agents. Because there's a handful. You go on Cap Friendly, there's a bunch of defensemen that are going to be available this summer that hey they they could go pick up uh and look at and, and you're right you know part of the thing with the cap space too that's going to help the ducks is Corey perry's two million does come off like you said eddie and also john moore he's on there at 2.7 and, and that earlier trade where the ducks took that on so right there's almost five million more in cap that you could go out and get one of these guys that i talked about 
that that's going to cost three four million and still give a Drysdale, Zegris, and Terry their money. So the Ducks have options. They're in the driver's seat. They can get things done. Um, they're going to have even more cap space. And then if they don't bring back Shattenkirk, that's $3.9 million. So, I mean, they have options here. I, I would think that they don't bring back Shattenkirk, then they need to go pick up somebody in free agency. If they don't get someone in free agency, maybe they bring back Shattenkirk for a year and then start bringing up these young guys and let them play next season. Yeah, Shattenkirk's not going to make that much money. Though. I think it'd be fair, a, a million five for Shattenkirk. He hasn't really played that well. He hasn't really provided that like that much needed offense that uh, he's that he's an offensive defenseman. But I, I don't think he's going to get the same amount of money. I, I would be like, maybe like under two million if we bring him back. But that's going to be wait and see. Um, see, with a lot of these free agents too that that are coming in that want to sign the Ducks may have to overpay for someone like, to sign for like the last place team. It's going to be hard to try to attract those free agents to, to, to come over here. And I don't want them necessarily signing all these big names to try to do what New Jersey did years ago when they were signing big-name players, uh, traded for Subban, and, and this and that. And it, it didn't work out for them. It, it backfired on them. They ended up uh, going through cap hell, and it just uh, their team which wasn't the same. So I, I just want the, the Ducks just to kind of trust this process they're going and, and let it just go naturally and – and use the pipeline and kind of be careful. Don't just be signing players to accelerate something. It's just, it's, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. You try, you know, bring in a big name guy. I mean, they already tried it with Klingberg and it didn't work out. And and there's something to be said there. You you, you made a good point. I mean, if somebody uh, is a big name player, they played on some teams, they've had playoff time and all that, are they going to want to come to the Ducks and, and sit on the team for two to three years before they're competitive? I don't know if they're really going to want to do that. So maybe you do bring back Shattenkirk on a cheaper deal like you talked about, and then you let these other guys fill in. You let Lacombe fill in. You let um, Hellison fill in. Maybe you bring back Harrington. Maybe you uh, you know, you know got Benoit that's on RFA. You have him. Uh, White's going to be back in the mix as well. Vakanainen hopefully is healthy, uh, things like that. I, I still think they got to figure out something. It, it, I would like for them to bring in somebody to help out if they don't bring back Shattenkirk. So that's kind of what we're looking at. A, a lot of things. The, the good thing is the Ducks have a lot of cap space, a lot of things that they can do um, You know, going into the summer. I think it's going to be interesting to see how the free agency pans out, see how the draft pans out as well. So uh, a lot of stuff in the mix there. Uh, we we had a couple more uh, fan questions too to kind of to wrap up the show too, and we'll kind of talk about some stuff. We had the mighty jerseys asked us too. The thirtieth anniversary is next year. Uh, what do we think about the next jersey? I haven't really heard anything. I know we've talked a lot about jerseys this season. Um, they did release that logo. Uh, we posted that on, on social media. I am really excited about the jacket that they have because it, it's it's in the mighty ducks with the. The, uh, the old school writing, right, Mighty Ducks, but in orange. And then it's got the old school logo, but with the orange triangles. So I'm really curious to see what it's going to be. Uh, I, I, I still think it's going to be something Mighty Ducks, but but newer colors. I don't know. That's just kind of my feeling, Eddie. What, like, what do you think? I hope it's a black version of the custom one that I made with the old Ducks logo. Uh, the, the one I've, I've posted that you see when we went to a few games. It's a great one. one. That'd it's be a great cool. one. A ball black one or, you know what, just give the fans what they want. Just, just you don't have to do anything. Just grab the freaking eggplant Mighty Ducks jersey and boom, that's our 30th anniversary jersey. And everyone will be happy. Like the whole world will be cool. Connor Bedard wearing that would be awesome too. <laughs> that's a good point. And yeah, you're right. That If you guys haven't seen it, Eddie had this one that he, uh, kind of the newer, the it was the newer jersey but with the thrown back logo on top. And it looked pretty badass. I, I gotta admit, it looked pretty good. So even if they did something like that, it would be cool, uh, you know. And kept, you know, maybe they keep the orange as the third, and then come up with some kind of Mighty Duck logo, uh, you know, for the home and the way. Or, or maybe you make the Web D the third, and then just keep the Mighty Duck logo as the home and away. I, I mean, I, I don't think you can go wrong with that. I, I, I'd be very, very excited to see that. So, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Another question, you know, we had, I kind of touched on already, but Tom, our buddy from England, he talked about, you know, what's the best game you went to this season or watched. Uh, like I said, the best one in person, even though the Ducks lost, but they lost it. A lot of the games I went to in person was the one against Vancouver. Like I said, I liked, I liked seeing Hellison get that goal. 
and Lacombe getting his uh, debut underway. So that was fun. There were some, obviously, some other debuts by some of the other players too throughout the season, but I like that. I did talk about this too. I, I, the Stadium Series game, I was very excited. Uh, the, actually, the Winter Classic, I should say, because I, I never went to one. Got to go to that uh, at the beginning of uh, the year, calendar year. And I got to see Boston play Pittsburgh. Boston won that game. It went to Fenway Park. I'd never been to Boston. Uh, Winter Classic. So I kind of got a hat trick that weekend. Being able to do three things off my bucket list that I never got to do. So as far as this season, those were kind of the games that, that uh, at least in person, that I, I was excited about, Eddie. I don't know if there was anyone in particular that stood out to you or one that you watched um, that, you know, this last season that, that you really enjoyed. No, nothing really sticks out to me. Like I said, I, I've been dealing with a lot of uh, uh, stuff this this year with my dad and taking over his business and then my new job I have. So I just feel like my mind is scrambled and fried. But I, I, I would want to say, like, the best games I've been to this this last season are the ones I went with you, Mike. We got to just hang out, socialize, have a good time. And despite, I, I believe, uh, the Ducks lost two and won two of the, the games this season I went with you with. But it was just still fun just to just to connect with you again, see you in person, and, and see all the fans, too. People coming up to us, thanking us for the show, and just, like, mingling with us. Those are, those are like, my favorite memories of this last season. So hopefully uh, next season... We'll be able to hit some more games up together, and I'll be going going to more games too. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we always have fun when we go, for sure. A blast. You know what? I forgot too. I wasn't even thinking about. It. I knocked myself out. Remember that? I, I yeah, forgot. Yeah, jumped on the stairs. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Yeah, the one game that uh, I forgot which one it was, but they they won, and we were, and I was jumping down the stairs, and I hit the damn ceiling. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh my god, I'm laughing right now. I, was, I wasn't even thinking about it. But uh, yeah, that that I'll never forget that moment. That was that was uh, interesting. Uh, watch watch the low bridges when you're going down the certain stairs there because I remember I hit the bill of my hat on that. Oh my god, that was that was crazy. But that was crazy. a fun game. I, I something happened in that game too that got us really fired up and excited. We were just all going crazy going down the stairs. I know they won. I want to say it was an overtime win. I think it was. It was and something then, like it. it was early in the season. Yeah, you jumping on and hitting your head, and you fall. I'm like, oh, and it, like I'm, <laughs> I'm a little buzzed too, so I can't fully 100 percent like react fast to go grab you. I have a delayed reaction, but you know what? The fans around us too, when they, they saw you fall, like like everyone was helpful and helping you up. And I know you were embarrassed, but it, it was that was funny. We we talked about that for weeks, and it still puts a smile on my face just thinking <laughs> of that. But we all have been there. I'm glad I'm not. Uh, Six what six seven you are. So <laughs> yeah. if I yeah. jump, I'm not gonna hit anything <laughs> anytime soon. So I'm glad. Uh, I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm glad for being only a uh, five nine. Yeah. Now after that game, I remember now every time I leave, I just hold the rail and I walk down all like like all mellow. Don't get all crazy. Yeah, I forgot about that. That that was a funny moment. Um, also, we had uh, I want to shout out Noble Ale Works too. We had some watch parties there in the beginning of the season. I remember we had one. Where it was raining like crazy, and there was a there was a, a good group of us that were there watching one of the games early in the season. So shout out to the people that came out to that as well, and we'll we'll look at doing that next season too. And shout out to everybody joining the uh, NHL bracket uh, again. I think we had a hundred plus. We'll do some giveaways for the top three as well. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I want to announce too. I, for, I totally forgot about this, and if you, if you guys are listening, my bad. It's been super super busy. But we have our, our our fantasy winner. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Our fantasy hockey. So we'll be sending uh, the winners out some uh, some kind of swag, some things uh, moving forward. Let me see. I'm trying to look up real quick who won, and it's gonna tell me. I want to say it was the final. Jay Schultz ended up winning. Nice. Well, he we will send him some stuff. And and then, we will send him some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. third place winner was why the heck to you have to be mad. <laughs> yeah, he's a third place winner. So I want to thank everybody for 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 joining the fantasy league. And next season I will make it better. I know I was in a rush this season. I did it a day late, and there's things I need to work on on the on the fantasy hockey for next season. But it's gonna be a lot better, and we'll be more organized. And that that's my responsibility. That's my fault. I was just kind of like rushing to do this. But yeah, it'll be better. But thank you everyone for. For, for jumping on and, and, and being part of it. So it was fun. Next season's going to be even better. But, yeah, we'll definitely send 
the top three people out some kind of uh, swag or some kind of a like gifts. Yeah, Eddie and I will get together. We'll figure that out. We'll get the people in the fantasy hockey that, and then obviously the people in the bracket as well. So we will make sure you guys uh, get some stuff from us. And you can still go to tpnhockey.com and buy some stuff on there. You can also join us on patreon.com slash ducks and pucks. I, I got people on there too that those of you that are on there, I'm going to be sending you guys stuff as well. So I look forward to that. Um, I, I guess the the last question, kind of funny, our, our man Jesse um, from Old City Sports, uh, you know, the one that, that runs, the big man that runs the show, he kind of asked us about our thoughts on Zegers, Eddie, being one of the most hated players in the league. What what do you think, you know, that last game against the Kings, he got booted out, got a misconduct, and, and slammed a stick in the tunnel. What's your thoughts on, on, on Zegers, um, you know, and, and this whole season and going forward for next year? I don't know why people hate him so much. I, I, I just don't understand like the hate he gets. Like he's not even. I mean, yeah, he's flashy, he's fancy, but I, 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 I guess I understand the, the little cocky attitude he has. A little, a little like, oh, I don't know. I, I like it though. I, I don't know why. And normally, like I have that like old school mentality kind of mind. Like, hey, you're, you're still a boot. You're a rookie. Blah blah blah. But not, with him, it just he has that kind of swag, and I don't think he gives a shit. I think. It just fills his fire. The more hate he gets, I just it just builds his ego higher, like more and more higher. But I, I'm glad that he he's he is him, and it's just it's crazy how so much hate he gets from um from all the fan bases that that play against him. But I just hope he doesn't change and keep doing what he's doing, and, and goes from there. Yeah, obviously he's he's young. He's a kid at, at his age. We all made a uh, maturity questionable things. But I I love him, so that's all that matters. Ducks fans love him. Uh, everyone else can can love him when he's like lifting the Stanley Cup one day. Shit. Yeah, I, I mean I'm with you too, and it kind of goes back to that that topic earlier or discussion earlier. And this show we've kind of talked this, about this maybe the last year or two uh, about the Ducks having an identity and having character and having swag and having this and that. And he brings that. And, yeah, maybe he needs to tone it down a little bit when he's talking to the refs. I could kind of see that. Uh, you know, I made some funny gifts of him sticking out his tongue and other things like that along the bench. And, and some funny – those were some of the funny moments, too, this year was uh, some of the things that Zegers did. And then, obviously, some of his, his nice, crazy goals. He even had that one where he, he faked like he was passing it to Shattenkirk. Looked like he was going to shoot. Then he passed to Shattenkirk. Shattenkirk scored. Uh, you know, he had some nice different plays like that throughout the season. But I, I, I like that. And I think that that's what that the Ducks team needs is uh, uh, some of that swagger. And, I, and, you know, some people were upset with the way he was at the end of the season, uh, that game against the Kings. But, you know, when you when you lose 13 games in a row, and, and you know, we can we can all talk about, oh, tanking, get Bedard, and, you know, first draft lottery position. But these players are still human. You know, I, I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose multiple games in a row, let alone 13. And then to get kicked out because, you know, he said whatever he said at the end of that game, and then you lose to your crosstown rivals. I like the fact that he went to the locker room mad and threw his stick because it shows that he has passion. It shows that he cares. It shows that he's competitive. And that's what you want. You want players like that on your team. Uh, and I'm all for it. So the people that hate Zegers, they can all go pound sand. I really don't care. Um, I, I would just tell him, just just tone it down a notch, talking to the refs. Maybe Tamu or Getzloff kind of like rubbed off on him a little bit. <laughs> uh, more, more Getzloff because they actually play together. But... You know, those guys had always had a little bit of an issue with the ref. So maybe if he just tones that a little bit. But other than that, I love the dude. I love what he's doing. And and I think if the Ducks can get that, you know, hone that energy together amongst the team. Um, like you said, Eddie, you know, you get Bedard in there or whoever we get in this draft lottery. And you build up this team that they're going to lift the Stanley Cup one day. Because um, he, he's got that fire in him. And uh, I, I, I like it. I mean, it's, it was a rough year, but I'm really, really excited to see what's going to happen in the next couple seasons. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's, it's, the future is bright for the Ducks. I know right right now it's one of our, our darkest times. I, I, I want to say darkest times in franchise history. I want to say that. But, I mean, yeah, I, you made a good point, too. I, I was going to mention that, too. I love his passion. And the last time the Ducks and Kings played, there was some kind of heated things going on. The fights were ramped up. This 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 game too. It got a little ugly. I'm, I'm liking seeing this rivalry like get reignited again because 
The last few times, a uh, couple seasons, we've been watching the Ducks and Kings. It's been really boring. There's not really that bad blood or hatred. But it seems like this, these teams are starting to hate each other more and more. And it seems like, like I said, this tanky thing. But these players don't care. They want to win. They're really competitive. And that just proves having Zegris is like break a stick and just flip out for getting tossed out from the game. So I'm glad we saw that from him. And I don't want him to change one bit. He'll mature with time. We all know how hothead uh, Getzloff was, and he became one of the best captains in the National Hockey League. I want to say one of the best cap- uh, captains in Ducks history. So I just, it just takes maturity, but I just hope he doesn't change. He's the reason why the Ducks got put in the map, Anaheim, all those like, TNT games that they were uh, on this season. It's because of Zegris. Uh, you have NHL Network talking uh, so much more about Anaheim Ducks hockey that they have like, ever that I can remember is because of Zegers' play. You had a that Michael B. Jordan actor that just did the, the Creed Three movie. He reached out to Zegers and was talking to Zegers. So he was just he's not even a hockey fan, but he saw that play. It's like that just wowed him. So who knows? Maybe we'll see Michael B. Jordan one day at a at a Ducks game, hanging out with his boy Zegers. But I think Zegers really is putting the the Anaheim Ducks in the map. And if this whole draft is going to be rigged, I think someone like Zegers will make Gary Bettman rig the draft and the Anaheim will get the, the first overall pick and get Bedard because that's going to be a fun team to watch and it's going to be just crazy seeing Bedard and Zegris and McTavish and it's just going to be really, really fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, I mean, uh, we'll wrap up the show and yeah, we'll, we'll probably do another one shortly after that draft lottery and we'll see what happens and, and how it all pans out. We'll still have a couple more shows during the summer. I know stuff's been crazy for both of us, but I uh, appreciate you guys uh, listening. Appreciate the support, you know, joining the uh, fancy hockey, the the bracket playoffs, uh, coming to the watch parties and everything else. So, um, you know, just uh, another year down the books. Uh, we'll be going into the uh, 30th season for the Ducks next year. And uh, really excited to have you along with us. And uh, let's go Ducks. <laughs>